Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. My name is Jessica Maravilla. I use she, her, and a pronouns, and I am the ACLU of Oregon's policy director. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for commitment to a more just Oregon. Uh, to get us started, this event is being recorded and will be available on our website later tonight. We will also send out a copy of the slides and the links with the recording tonight. So don't feel pressure to take extensive notes. Please just feel free to share with friends and your family. And just a side note that the intent of this video is all just so to be able to share it with our legislators on such an important matter to us. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our captioner, Regina Demoville from LNS Captioning, our ALS interpreter, Sakira Mehta, and Christina Nguyen, ACLU of Oregon's communications director for making tonight possible. Thank you so much for the, all the work you do. If you prefer to have the interpreter's window large and the rest of the participants' windows much smaller, you can use the pen feature to keep one window larger than the rest. And if anyone wants ASL interpretation uh, to ask a question, please just let us know by sending a message in the chat box. So we will get started um, and, and we would like to do so today, first of all, with the land acknowledgement. So today, many of us are located on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, the Klamath, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and other indigenous nations. We pay our respect to our elders, past and present, who have stewarded this land for generations. And before we dive in, I'd also like to ground us today in some group agreements. By participating today, um, it is our expectation that you will create a space with values and respect uh, in differences of race, ethnicity, immigration status, age, gender, sexual uh, orientation, religion, your ability, uh, and socioeconomic circumstances. So we will each respect and contribute to the ACLU's culture of belonging by fostering an equitable and inclusive experience with all aspects of community work by centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color's voices and experiences. So this will look like listening to understand, making space for and prioritizing oppressed voices, speaking my truth responsibly, which means taking responsibility for your impact regardless of your intent, and for white people and other privileged identities to not put the burden on BIPOC and other oppressed groups to educate you about the harm that your actions and behavior created, to being willing to do things differently and experience discomfort, seeing discomfort tension as an opportunity to grow and not a barrier to it. So thank you everyone for your willingness to be here with us and honoring this space. We do have a, a content warning that a lot of these descriptions of police violence and brutality. Um, so tonight, again, we hold this space one to inform everyone about an important legislative issue that is occurring this week. And two, to provide a space to anyone who would like to share their story. To give some background on the urgent matter at hand today, I would like to introduce my colleagues, partners, um, and part of the ACLU family, our executive director, Sandy Tung, as well as our legal director, Kelly Simon. Kelly, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, good night, everyone. Good to connect with you all in some form. I just wanna start us off with a little history and context of why we're here today. So just looking at the last five years alone, the ACLU of Oregon and other Oregon-based organizations, including organizations like the Oregon Justice Resource Center, Don't Shoot Portland, Disability Rights Oregon, we filed over 15 lawsuits challenging police violence at protests. And we filed many more challenging police violence beyond the protest context. In 2017, Portland police officer Andrew Hurst shot an unarmed Qantas Hayes, a teenage kid, three times with an AR-15 rifle from 10 feet away while Qantas was surrendering on his knees with his hands up. Just a few months later, Jeremy Christian, a white man, murdered two people during a racist tirade on a MAX train. Police took a non-compliant Jeremy Christian, who was brandishing a knife, into custody without incident or injury to Christian. Shortly after these murders, a white supremacist group called the Proud Boys came to town for a rally. The community responded with large mm -hmm. counter-protests. 
but who did the police end up shooting and dispersing? Our community. Who did the police protect, giving escorts and shields? White supremacists. In 2018, the same thing. 2019, the same thing. We'll get to 2020 in a moment, but you all know the pattern. Mm. And many in our community know the police violence and bias in the daily interactions and in response to peaceful protests challenging, challenging racist policing that has persisted for generations. Let's remember Kendra James, who Portland police officer Scott McAllister killed in 2003. Portland police stole a mother, a daughter, a friend, a neighbor. Kendra James' family is still searching for answers. Let's reimagine what would it look like to build a public safety system that supports Black women thriving. Portland police ain't it. Our experiences and our lawsuits have made clear that we need the legislature to be vigilant in restricting and co controlling police abuse. We need accountability tools that allow us to reckon with the harm that police have caused us. In 2020, after Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George, George Floyd, people in Oregon took to the streets with the rest of the nation to demand an end to policing, to call for smarter and safer investments in our communities. In response and consistent with the patterns of bias we know well, police, especially Portland police, indiscriminately unleashed large volumes of munitions on protesters, including tear gas and other chemical weapons. In Portland, we saw expired tear gas. We saw thermal foggers emitting clouds bigger than city blocks. We saw protesters gas from all sides with no path to safety. Tear gas seeped into homes where children suffered reactions. Munitions littered the streets and rivers. We saw pools of chemicals leaching into storm drains and chemical residue saturating our park grounds for days. People with uteruses saw changes in menstruation, Children saw schools and neighborhoods look like war zones. The community was held in a chemical chokehold for weeks. And still, the community voice resounded loud and clear. You know what you said. The Oregon Justice Resource Center and civil rights attorneys partners, including Jesse Merrithew and Ashley Albies, represented Don't Shoot Portland in, in the swift response with a lawsuit securing a restraining order that prohibited the use of tear gas, except when lives or safety were at risk, and then provided for additional munitions restrictions. Portland police used them anyway. The legislature stepped in during a 2020 special session and also limited tear gas to use during riots. They banned chokeholds and passed other police accountability laws. Portland police abused us anyway, simply using riot declarations as cover to continue using tear gas. During the 2020 regular session, those of us here and many in Oregon demanded more from the legislature. Together, we changed low-level crimes, typically abused by police, to justify arrests of peaceful protests. We changed dispersal order laws, removing the arrest mandates. We restricted receipt of military surplus gear. We required identification on police uniforms. We ensured police don't cooperate with ICE. We required police to report misconduct. We required background checks for police, including checking for participation in hate groups. We required police to participate in federal use of force data collection. We required officers to intervene when they see each their other officers engaged in misconduct. We protected local oversight authority. And we also passed a munitions bill that while ultimately a compromise required that restrictions required restrictions on munitions use and prohibited indiscriminate use of force. That bill also included uh, protections for access to things like medical help from protest medics or others actually out there to keep us safe. As Representative Bynum said last year, we heard Oregonians when they said the power of policing comes from the community. And she said, we also realize that our work is not yet done. 
We at the ACLU of Oregon agree, and we are committed to demanding more, and we refuse to backstep. But now, despite the legislature passing a compromise that still allows police to use weapons of war on our neighbors and friends, the police and the cities in Oregon are working to roll it back. While claiming to be seeking mere clarification and technical fixes, the cities and police in Oregon are requesting far more than that. The cities and police are trying to insert a loophole and limits to the application of this weapons bill that gives them more leeway to use violence. They are trying to roll back protections created to protect those providing community-based public safety, protest medics. To both of those things, hell no. We're here tonight to continue making our demands loud and clear. Ban tear gas, full stop. Ban rapid fire munitions. Give us access to police misconduct records. Give us a clear pathway to court without barriers like qualified immunity. Protect journalists, legal observers, medics, and protesters alike from arbitrary dispersal orders and indiscriminate force that silence the community's voice. Reduce our dependence on police. And in the meantime, require police to transform into de-escalation systems, not violent ones. And invest in new public safety models that actually keep us safe. Hold cities accountable for training and sustaining these biased police cultures. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Kelly, so much for that very thorough yet synthesized explanation about how we cannot roll, roll back on a bill that was worked on so hard over the last couple, several years actually, um, and how these technical quote unquote changes have actually very drastic impacts. And so here tonight, we have folks that have signed up and they do wanna get their voices heard. So I will be calling on them. If you can please just state your name and how you're coming into the space. First up, I have Teresa Rayford. Teresa, I invite you into the space. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is, again, Teresa Rayford. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm here as a community organizer, but I also have a nonprofit called Don't Shoot Portland. Um, I'm here today because I want to testify to my experience, uh, not only on the receiving end of the violence from the Portland police, but the, the, the tear gas and how it's used indiscriminately against anyone who shows up, in my opinion, for black lives or to resist white supremacist violence. Um, we, have a, we have a history here in Portland of undermining the values and the humanity of people of color and especially black and indigenous people in our communities that speak out against violence using their freedom of speech and their right to protest. And we also have the experience and the history of a violent response from our lawmakers by allowing law enforcement to use indiscriminate use of force, uh, violence, impact munitions, and when I witnessed what was happening in the year 2020 during the George Floyd uprisings, even though I had been on the receiving end of that violence several times protesting for some of the people that Kelly Simon mentioned, um, it, it hurt more because we knew that our federal government was looking for ways to keep people safe during the pandemic during a very crucial time where the use of chemicals could actually harm our respiratory systems and the way that we're allowed to use our freedom of expression and our freedom of movement um, at a time that there was a global uprising in support of black lives against the use of police violence. And so the fact that they've done that, and in my experience, it felt retaliatory. It felt like it was a restriction of our human rights and our dignity. And I would hope that we wouldn't roll back any kind of bills that have mandated change that will develop into substantial change that will allow people to feel like there is a reason to protest. You should be showing up. Um, I, I, you know, I'm here today because I want people to testify on House Bill 4131. I would hope that people will read the language in this document. And I hope that if you're not able to show up um, and you can't see the document that you'll actually send in your written testimony, but we can't use force against people that want to express their rights. So thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Teresa, for everything that you do and, and for showing up in this space today on such an important matter. Um, next up, we have Jennifer Jones. Jennifer? 
Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Jones. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a community member. Um, I'm here today to testify um, <clears throat> the experience that my daughter and I had when attending a protest in 2020. My daughter came to me and said to me um, right after George Floyd was murdered that she wanted to attend a protest because she'd often asked herself when reading history what she would have done during the civil rights movement. So we found a family friendly protest and we attended. The police eventually asked people or yelled, I guess, to people to disperse. We didn't know what direction to go. Um, and we were hearing rumors that there were maybe white supremacists that were targeting people that were leaving the protests. And if you didn't have a large group to leave with, you shouldn't. So we remained in place um, until the police started to fire, I guess, pepper balls, um, and um, which was becoming like an irritant, um, particularly to my daughter's throat. So we began to look to see where we could leave, but we seemed like we were surrounded by police and people were starting to panic. Um, they deployed tear gas. Um, and I was very concerned because my daughter has a congenital heart defect. Um, when she was born, she had it. And I wasn't sure how the chemical ir irritants were going to um, impact her and um, whether or not we were gonna need to go to the hospital. I finally was able to make it to my car and we were trying to find even just a way to get downtown and at that point the police were chasing people well west of the area that we had been and I um, was able to see with my own eyes as we were stopped as they were chasing the crowd them hit a kid with a baton until they found, fell on the ground um, and their friends were trying to help them up. Um, as we were finally able to make it towards a bridge to leave the downtown area, um, I was able to see that there was what looked like a female teen, early 20s maybe, who was um, passed out or looked unconscious on the ground next to a police officer who I didn't see at that time um, giving any um, emergency aid. Um, my daughter has since um, never attended a protest. She said she will not attend a protest again. Um, she doesn't believe that the Portland police will ever be held accountable. She is now doesn't believe that um, our black community members will ever uh, see equal justice. And so I wanna urge people to um, vote no on changing the language of this house bill and not to roll back any of the small restrictions we were able to make to the police um, to stop um, violence, particularly with chemical munitions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for your courage and, and for being here tonight. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite into the space, Chris Weiss. Chris, if you'd like to share your story with us. Okay. Following months, I volunteered a volunteer medic at the George Floyd protests, and um, oh, during said time, I treated lacerations. We have you now, Chris. Oh, am I? Oh, am I on? There was a, a lag on there, so if you'd like to um, to start you're, your story now. You're good. You're good. Uh, my name's Chris Wise. Sorry, I'm on a phone. My uh, computer is currently in the garage. But um, yeah, um, during the summer of 2020, during the George Floyd protests, I volunteered as a volunteer medic, um, and as I was saying during that time, um, I saw and treated lacerations, puncture wounds, contusions, abrasions, a couple broken bones, chemical rashes, chemical burns, eye irritants, torn ligaments, a few well-placed impact munitions to the groin, um, all at the hands of our law enforcement. Um, during that time, I also suffered my own lacerations and contusions and puncture wounds and sprains and chemical burns and incendiary burns and a pretty gnarly head trauma at the hands of local law enforcement. Um, and uh, here in Portland, I know that our police have proven time and time again on local and levels simply can't create use of force, um, especially in an active or emergent crisis well documented with histories of abusing their positions, abusing access to equipment, uh, and abusing the general public. And uh, Many of these officers still remain in the same positions they do uh, back then today, 
there hasn't really been any accountability for that. Um, and a good step towards that accountability is the current wording on the House bill um, that we are, you know, contesting. Um, and uh, from my experience, I know that the police won't use crowd control munitions responsibly. They don't use tear gas responsibly. They shoot out windows. They poison trees. The gas children sleep in their homes. Um, not only are these forms of crowd control harmful to our city, but the PBB has shown us time and time again that they have a callous disregard for public safety. And people expressing the First Amendment rights deserve adequate access to first aid, regardless of source. And they have um, the freedom to you. Ugh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, they deserve the freedom to state their opinions and to express themselves without fearing use of force by law enforcement. So I am once again incredibly opposed to changing the language on this House bill. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. We appreciate you um, and so many others coming, showing up tonight and, and really just being able to provide some stories of, of personal experiences and traumas that impact changing the language to this bill so much. At this point, we would like to take a short, very short uh, three minute break. Um, we have other folks that are here tonight and wanna share their story. We want, just, we want to be cognizant of our ASL interpreter. So we will give her a three minute break. Um, so thank you so much folks. We will stay on um, and be back in three minutes.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarika, for being here tonight. Uh, we appreciate the work you do. Um, and thank you, everybody. As we continue to hear some of the stories, we understand that these can be triggering. So please use some time to reflect um, and find the best way to cope, something that makes you happy, something that makes you feel good. Um, so we're all in this together. And this is why this is so very important. So uh, up next, I'd love to bring to the space Dr. Brita Torbrimson Ohario. Dr. Brita, mm -hmm. the space is yours. Thank you. So um, I'm Dr. Brita Torbrimson Ohario. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a public health researcher and a nurse, uh, and I've been exposed to tear gas during protests. I've researched it and I've provided medical care to those who've been exposed to it. I'm gonna read my statement so I stay on track here. Uh, so to be clear, um, tear gas is developed to harm human bodies in a variety of ways, to cause burning of the eyes, the nose, blocking the ability to breathe, causing vomiting, skin burns, and disorientation. This is the intended impact of tear gas. We're told without sufficient evidence that these harms to the human body from tear gas are temporary and only last a few minutes. But I ask, where is this evidence? Because instead our research is showing something else, that there's lasting harm from tear gas, causing days to weeks of headaches, diarrhea, eye pain, and coughing, to name a few. But I wanna be specific about something else we are learning about tear gas and the human body. And to quote Dr. Rachel Hardiman, police violence is not just a public health issue, it's an issue of reproductive justice. If we apply this to the use of tear gas by police on protesters, it is alarming. The growing scientific evidence that my colleagues and I have gathered demonstrates that tear gas may be directly harming reproductive systems. Those with uteruses report changes in their bleeding and what we commonly call periods or menstrual cycles. Also debilitating menstrual cramping, breast and chest tenderness, and some are attributing miscarriages or changes in their fertility due to tear gas exposure. In public health, when our communities report harm, we listen. And as a nurse scientist, I'm greatly concerned as we know that both protesters and neighborhood residents, including children, have been exposed to dangerous chemical weapons, and we do not know how much harm has been caused to their bodies and potentially their reproductive health. Therefore, as a public health scientist, I oppose the use of tear gas and chemical weapons by police in our communities. Thank you. Thank you for, for that perspective. Um, just another way that it impacts us. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call on Casey Lewis. Casey. Before Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Casey Lewis. I'm the managing attorney for the Mental Health Rights Project with Disability Rights Oregon. Uh, I am also a person who lives with mental illness myself. I spent a significant amount of time at the protests in 2020. I've also shown up at a few counter protests of the Proud Boys. Um, I was tear gassed regularly, have been hit with a few batons, um, but I know that there are people here who have greater medical expertise than I do. There are people here who spent a lot more time at the protests than I did. Um, there are people here who've been fighting for those things for a lot longer. Um, and so I do not wanna belabor my own experience at the protests too much. Um, instead, what I think I can most helpfully contribute to this discussion is talking a little bit about the legislative process and sort of why, um, other than the substantive things that it does, this bill is sort of an outrageous way of trying to roll back the, the progress that we have made. Um, so for those who don't know, the original bill was um, passed with uh, negotiation with the police, the sheriffs and everything. Um, it was very much a compromise bill, which doesn't mean that it wasn't a good bill, but it certainly wasn't everything that you would want to see if you were looking for the most just outcome possible. Now we have those same people who originally said, well, you know, meet us in the middle. 
um, we'll compromise, we'll figure out something that works for everyone. Now coming back and sort of behind closed doors saying, actually, there are some changes that we'd like you to make. Um, and we're not going to bring these to the other people, to the other people who are at that table. Uh, we're going to call them technical fixes, uh, and we're going to try to get them passed sort of under the cover of nobody paying any attention to them. Um, I can tell you that uh, that is how these things are done by certain players in policy is they will give you the very least they possibly can and then they'll spend the next five years chipping away at it in every way that they possibly can and so it is incredibly important when we have made these gains um, and when we have to some extent ensured the safety of protesters ensured their ability to protest without getting chilled by the violent conduct of the police we need to draw a line in the stand and say we're not just going to let you roll this back absolutely absolutely thank you so much casey um i'd like to now call to the space cat mahoney hi uh, my name is cat mahoney my pronouns are she her and i've been a legal observer since 2017 and in the last five years of observing police responses to protests, the use of chemical and less lethal weapons has increased while their de-escalation tactics have decreased. Uh, prior to 2020, police mostly used flashbangs, pepper balls, and would herd protesters out of areas. But in 2020, Portland police relied heavily on chemical weapons like tear gas and mace in the form of grenades, paintball-sized capsules that broke upon impact, and rubber bullets. In many cases, the police started the riot by firing tear gas and other weapons into a crowd that was engaging in passive resistance or dispersing. I can name a few dates. On June 2nd, 2020, which has been called Tear Gas Tuesday, when police decided that they were tired of having thousands of people protesting downtown for Black Lives Matter, and they declared that it was over. Some people started to walk towards the Burnside Bridge, complying with the order to disperse. I saw police come up behind them and shoot them in the back with pepper balls and throw smoke grenades. The people were complying. On June 6, 2020, police declared an unlawful assembly and moments later before the crowd could even disperse, flashbangs were fired into the crowd over their heads, blocking them from where they were walking to and from behind. I saw police come out and shoot behind the chain link fence indiscriminately into the crowd. I saw people leaving and then be cut off by police cars only to be turned back towards the Justice Center and get shot at again with pepper balls and smoke bombs and tear gas. Fast forwarding to June 30th, which was only hour, which, uh, hours after Governor Brown had signed the bill that banned tear gas, except when police declare a riot, the police started a riot. I saw police heard protesters east on North Lombard walking by apartment complexes and residential side streets. I saw police fire grenades over the heads of protesters and land in front of them, cutting off their pathway to exit. They created what has been called a kill box, where they uh, throw grenades in front of the people and then they come up behind, so you are trapped. I saw protesters head down side streets into residential areas and police fired tear gas down those streets. I saw tear gas grenades land at the Shell gas station. I saw people in their apartment buildings had to close their windows. I saw a lawn go on fire because of the police. I saw a flashbang roll under a car and could have started a fire if not for protesters who quickly acted and kicked it out. There's a ton of examples I have from the nights I went out, but the pattern is the same. The police start a riot, they fire chemical weapons, and then people are still dealing with trauma and illnesses today. Allowing the police to have access to chemical weapons does not make us safer. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you for your bravery and courage to share with us tonight. Um, next, we have Dr. Juniper Simonis. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Juniper Simonis. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I'm speaking here today um, as both a uh, recipient of uh, brutality in, in the form of kinetic and chemical weapons by law enforcement in Oregon, but also as a researcher and a scientist who studies their impacts on urban communities and ecosystems. So when I think about an urban ecosystem, I think about all of us, people included, all the way um, through to the little critters. Um, and the fact of the matter is that chemical weapons are fundamentally indiscriminate, point blank. 
You can't target somebody with a cloud. Like that, it doesn't work like that. And I want to point out specifically what's being proposed as an amendment to this bill to point, uh, to reiterate Casey's point, the bill already carves out a riot exception. Kat mentioned this as well. What this uh, amendment uh, would include would say, a law enforcement agent may not use a chemical incapacitant for crowd control except riot exemption or when the chemical incapacitant is used against an individual engaged in conduct, otherwise justifying the use of physical force under Oregon law. The size of that loophole is enough to drive many trucks through, just to say it lightly. Um, that would allow officers to use chemical weapons against anybody that they would use physical, could be legally allowed to use physical force against. It's um, been shown through their, um, through law enforcement's uh, actions, uh, including through those uh, actions of officers and supervisors who are supposedly uh, properly trained and have taken all of the legally required training courses um, in chemical weapons deployment. They, it's been shown through their actions um, that not only do they act with uh, wanton disregard for human and uh, ecosystem impacts, but they also specifically target already marginalized communities and people and leave waste behind. These officers and their agencies don't clean this stuff up. The city's own demonstrated heavy metal studies of the Storm water flowing out from under the courthouse shows between a one and a four fold increase in heavy metals that are known to be carcinogenic. Like these impacts are substantial and are long term, and we cannot allow them to add a new exception of such breadth. We need to keep pushing forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, and, and I agree. We need to keep pushing forward and really appreciate everybody sharing their, their experiences and their personal stories today. We have three more uh, people that have signed up and, and share that they would like to, to show up tonight. So uh, I'll now uh, grant the space to Andre Miller. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for uh, to ACLU of Oregon for providing this space for us to be able to speak on our experiences. Um, my name is Dre Miller. Um, I'm coming to you today in my personal capacity representing myself uh, and going to talk to you about an experience that I actually had during 2020. During 2020, um, I helped to organize uh, a group of individuals that uh, provided uh, medical attention and support to people that were actually uh, hurt and injured um, by the hands of police officers. Um, during protests in downtown Portland. Uh, we were able to um, work with a lot of different people and including myself. Um, on July 2020, um, I was shot in the face by a tear gas canister um, and was attended to by some of the medics that actually worked with me. Um, it took about an hour and a half for me to get out of that environment. Um, I bled a lot. Um, and not only did I uh, have the the injury, but I was exposed to um, being exposed to the um, the tear gas. Um, I had brain cloudiness, headaches, um, and a loss of appetite. Um, I dealt with um, concussion-like symptoms for about six weeks, um, a lot of rehabilitation, a lot of counseling, and will continuously um, have a scar on my forehead from being hit with a tear gas canister. Um, it has caused me a lot of trauma as well as uh, caused trauma for my children. Uh, I am strongly for banning uh, the use of tear gas and, and chemical weapons as a, uh, as a, a tactic, tactic of crowd control. Um, and I believe that um, we definitely should not be uh, watering down any other house bill um, to try to use these for uh, Portland police or any other police departments to be able to uh, use as a crowd control tactic.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dre. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone for sharing their stories again tonight. We, we really encourage everybody to know that you can take action. And so after the next two speakers, we will be showing you some ways that you can take action and make sure that your voice and your story is also heard and that legislators know what we're demanding. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have two more uh, folks who would like to, to share their space tonight. And I'll, I'd like to share that space now with Simab Hussani. Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. Um, my name is Simab Husseini. And I am a community organizer with a focus on supporting Black, Muslim, and immigrant and refugee communities. I'm a co-founder of the state's uh, or, uh, state of Oregon's only Muslim civil rights organization, and I'm also a social justice and civil rights advocate. Um, um, also, uh, actually, uh, I'm with the Police Accountability Commission with the City of Portland to rebuild the new Portland Independence. Uh, Independent Police Review Board. Um, I'm here today uh, to join my communities and advocates in disapproval of HB 4131. I am of the communities directly impacted uh, uh, members by the actions of the Portland Police Bureau and their indiscriminate use of force against protesters. I was present with my colleagues and a family of four, one of whom was pregnant on what we call Tear Gas Tuesday, that was June 2nd. 2020, while grieving the loss of George Floyd and many others lost to the police brutality of law enforcement. Uh, during that day, in that moment, what could be considered the downtime after a large community event that day, where notable speakers, including community organizers and one who is now an Oregon senator, um, uh, spoke. This was a crowd draw that flashed images of solidarity for George Floyd across the entire nation. Uh, a notable one uh, in black and white was an aerial view of a crowd over the Burnside Bridge. As we took in that day's meeting on the corner of Fourth and Salmon, a fence went up on Taylor, stacking the most heavily equipped right police on the other side, and a long range acoustic device also known uh, by the acronym of LRAD, demanding us not to touch the fence. This set the stage for escalation, it escalated, they kettled the crowd and shut down any safe direction of exit. Kinet uh, kinetic impact projectiles and chemical incapacitants like CS gas and triple chasers rained down inward from fifth and third and straight in from, uh, uh, from Taylor. Uh, the family that broke away from my colleague and I unknowingly went straight towards Third Avenue and was fired upon with everything. Um, she was gassed, um, the, uh, so were the kids, um, and there was no aim to these munitions at all. Uh, that day, that moment, that time, not just that, uh, not just even then, um, just even throughout the protests, we, we are families, we're social workers, doctors, nurses, many of, them, many of the nurses who are documented street medics throughout the protests community organizers, legislative staffers, a lot of colleagues and friends um, that worked uh, within City Hall even, and everyone else. Uh, these munitions are absolutely indiscriminate. Since that day, I've spent dozens of nights out during the protests. Um, I've seen uh, Andre, I've uh, seen Juniper, uh, I've watched Juniper uh, collecting impact munitions, documenting everything. I've watched Kat, um, you know, LO out there. Um, and there has never been a moment that the Portland police wouldn't just call out any circumstance a riot. And constituting any moment a riot and using that phrase and just throwing it out, it, there's, there's no unit or, or metric of measurement behind when they would actually call it and use it. And every time that I've seen these munitions fired and uh, people gassed indiscriminately, uh, it has been... Um, uh, just out of a random call and a frustration to just call a riot uh, and uh, watch a trigger happy force rain down upon the rest of the crowd. I cannot profess to fully understand the dichotomous relationship police have with protesters demanding accountability versus the far right and white supremacist elements that espouse nothing but hate and intolerance, much of the times for faith they have no understanding of. And actually, they wind up feeling protected by our local law enforcement throughout, throughout the state. Um, to espouse 
actual violent I ideologies. Um, but the police force should never have access to more tools of escalation when they haven't even nailed down the tools of de-escalation. Thank you. No, th thank you, um, team up Again, appreciate everybody showing up and, and just empathizing with everybody that's gone through these struggles and how this could also be triggering. So please make sure that you put something on your calendar to take care of yourself. Um, your mental well-being is utmost important. And then last but not least, our final speaker for tonight is Juan Chavez. And after him, we will be able um, to put some links as well on the chat and on the, on the screen so that other folks can also submit their testimonies and know where to go to make sure that your voices and your stories are also heard. So Juan, the space is yours. Hi, everybody. My name is Juan Chavez. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the director of the Civil Rights Project at the Oregon, Oregon Justice Resource Center. We represent people in Oregon who have been harmed by the prison, jail, and policing systems we built. We take on those systems because they are historically and presently linked to maintaining white supremacy. We also take on those systems because they are unwilling and likely incapable of changing themselves. If something does change, it's because the public became fed up with their intransigence and affirmatively took away, take away the police and uh, prisons' power and their toys. Many people came to that conclusion too in the summer of 2020. There was a groundswell of support for banning tear gas and a lot of progress was made. Thanks in part to the legislature passing bills like the one the League of Cities is now trying to change. Taking this issue seriously means of course, ultimately defunding and dismantling the police and prison industrial complex. But we won't get there if the police are just going to be shooting tear gas canisters at our heads when we make that demand. And they shoot at us because the people at the top don't want to actually de-escalate and negotiate. They just want us to shut up and suffer. When we're getting gas, that's another day that Mayor Ted Wheeler and the rest of the city council gets to ignore us. And he wants to ignore us still, which is why we're all gonna show up to the legislature on Thursday, virtually, to tell him that we're not going anywhere. Um, I, 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 I wanna leave a, enough space for everybody to, to also hear about what to do next. So I'll, I'll, I'll cut this short. I, I'll just say that I'm grateful uh, to see these incredible advocates, organizers and defenders of our community here tonight. Um, it pains me deeply that we're still here uh, making these same demands and uh, even just having to protect the progress that's been made. Um, it's shameful in a lot of ways, it is also invigorating and, uh, and incredibly powerful to see that we are still willing to fight, even though the work is very difficult. Um, and just know that all of us here, and I know my colleagues at ACLU and DRO and, and all the other legal orgs will be there with you in loving solidarity. And uh, let's go show them what we're made of. Absolutely, and that's what we will be doing. So tonight, folks have heard from several different perspectives from legal observers, to scientists, to doctors, to people that have been there in the trenches and when everything was happening. So please take action today. We are here tonight to continue making our demands loud and that is ban tear gas, ban rapid fire ammunitions and give access to police for misconduct records, reduce our dependence on police and in the meantime, require police to transform into de-escalation system, not a violent one. We need to invest in a new public safety models that actually keep us safe. So here are some of the ways that you can submit your testimony. So the deadline will be this Friday at 3 p.m. And you can go, there's a link that um, our amazing communications director, Christina has put on there and we will be sending this to you as well as a follow-up. You would go in and you would select House Committee on Judiciary uh, and you select the time of the hearing, which will be on the 10th at 3.15 p.m. and you select House Bill 30, 4131. So at this time it's 4131. And we wanna say that we're against it. Uh, and so there will be, it's scheduled on to have a public hearing this Thursday, uh, but there is 24 hours until after the hearing to submit testimony. And that's why 
the deadline is until Friday. So the deadline for the public hearing will be this Thursday, February 10th at 2 p.m. if you would like to sign up to testify. Uh, so, and that way is the same link on there and you can complete the registration form. You select again, House Bill 4131 and you select against. And so you will be put on the list to testify. We hope that you can join us that day um, and really show how we feel very negatively and against House Bill 4131. And lastly, you can share your story anonymously and oppose the use of tear gas and chemical ammunitions through the ACLU. We will go ahead and amplify our community's experience with state legislators if you do not wish to uh, put your name and, and your information out there, we will go ahead and do that for you. All you have to do is share that story with us, with the ACLU. Um, so again, thank you so much for everybody. And we'll take our voices now to the Oregon Capitol. And we'll have to tell state lawmakers to create more, not less, accountability for police, violence, brutality, and killing. We are not going to stand up for what is happening today. And we're going to show up and let them know that. So please join us in all of those links. You will receive all of this information via email and follow-up. And we are happy to answer any questions that people might have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up.